So thank you so much, Raja, for joining us. Um, one of the UK's and Europe's leading experts on FASD. It's a real pleasure to have you back on our webinar at FASD Awareness. Now, individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder experience a range of problems in their cognitive, affective and physical functioning following prenatal alcohol exposure. In addition to multiple complex difficulties in daily living that impact well-being, often these behaviours are misunderstood and can lead to secondary mental health conditions. To understand FASD behaviours, we must first understand that FASD is permanent brain damage caused by prenatal alcohol exposure. And therefore, it is vital for us to understand how the alcohol can have such a damaging impact on the development of a fetus whilst in the womb. So, Roger, can you explain to us the processes that are involved that lead to this damage? So, it's, so um, yeah, so, so the, the simple answer is it's complicated, but broadly you can break it down into two broad broad aspects, the direct and the indirect. So the direct effect is the equivalent of like taking a sledgehammer to a rock where you're going to get a big sledgehammer, you're going to whack it and the heavier the sledgehammer, i.e. equivalent to more alcohol you drink, the bigger the sledgehammer, the more rock you're going to break off. Simple as that. Um, the indirect effect is to do with how genes are expressing themselves. And there's this thing we call epigenetic modifications, which is about switching protein moting genes on and off. And the more you switch them on and off, you lead to problems happening. And if you have a vulnerability in your genome, then that alcohol can switch something on and off, which is why there's so, so much variability in terms of the presentation. Part of the problem that you're, you have is trying to predict who is going to be at risk of which level of exposure because there are some people who are exposed to heavy levels who have no problems and some people who have tiny levels who have issues and it's to do with individual vulnerability because nothing is about one thing or another it's about a complex interplay between your environmental exposure here the alcohol your genetic makeup and the vulnerability and how these two are interplaying with each other and so that's part of the complexity that you see it the other thing is there are alcohol when we talk about it, has biological effects in certain ways and certain mechanisms. So, for example, this is now going to get technical, and I apologise for that. That's what um, we're here for. But what? So, just one simple example is GABA. It alcohol works on GABA A receptors. GABA A is a specific type of brain receptor which um, causes sedation. That's why it's the same. That's why you feel tired and and you fall asleep if you drink too much. You know that's what it does. It's sedating. It's the equivalent of diazepam doing the same kind of thing. It is one. Of, it's a sedating neurotransmitter in the brain. What the brain does in response to that is to create this this chemical called glutamate, which basically upregulates the cells and wakes you up. Okay, um, and it's a balance between these two things. The problem that you've got with alcohol is it's not the brain creating it. It's an external substance which is coming in and having an effect. And once it's metabolized, that GABA effect goes away. And all of a sudden, you've got all this glutamate washing around, um, which is toxic in, in its own right. So it causes cell death. It's the same thing in dementia, where you get part of the dementia kind of aspects is the brain death occurs because of imbalance between GABA and glutamate. Some of the glutamate stuff causes damage, which is why some of the treatments of it is about prevention of excessive amounts of glutaminergic activity. The same thing in schizophrenia, where you've got the brain damage from it, is excessive amounts of glutamate. The brain is not awash with billions of different chemicals. There's certain types of chemicals, certain types of receptors. So it has to work on this process and what gal alcohol does in just one example is cause damage through that and where those receptors lie those parts of the brain get damaged and so you tend to have more midline structures frontal lobes limbic system amygdala corpus callosum cerebellum are mostly affected with some preservation of lateral series so that's why we get that you can often find the artistic musical side of people is better you know mm -hmm. you see a lot of our families and a lot of the kids and the adults they're quite talented in their music and their art mm -hmm. um and so that is a la that's more more uh, sort of that's that's the bits often preserved whereas the central bits are often damaged um 
And so you find there's a combination of different things going on, but it's no one thing. It's a combination of lots of different things happening together because alcohol does at, it's, there's at least nine different mechanisms that alcohol has been identified to cause problems with, if not more. Uh, and so it's not a simple one, but you can see that absolutely there's a lot going on. And the, the, of course, the impact on the brain, because the central nervous system throughout the pregnancy period, it's always developing, isn't it? And even after um, birth. So therefore, the impact on the brain Alcohol can have that impact on the brain at any point during the the fetal development. Yeah. So so the brain starts developing at day 18. In the early parts of the pregnancy, you're starting to get the broader aspects of neurons that are being produced, um, the proteins that lead to white matter production. They're all kind of starting to be embedded and differentiating, and they can have downstream effects if you cause damage immediately second and third trimester you get migration so this the frontal lobes of the brain compared to the older levels of the brain you know the old levels of brain have three layers in the frontal lobes you have six and what happens is you get migration between the three layers to set so you get a replication of the kind of the layers of the brain but they have to migrate and if the cells don't migrate properly because the proteins that lead to cell migration being damaged it's like taking the ladder and taking the middle out of it you ain't going to get to the top um you know it's it's a bit like that and so you have to think about how does this all fit together um to lead to things happening and what you have is a brain that is not wired properly you know and that's partly what goes wrong so you know it, you end up with inefficiencies in how things happen so people can do things kids and adults with fasd can function if everything else is perfect or if everything else is going right, when you put challenges on them and you expect people to be able to function in a neurotypical way where there aren't any issues, that's when things get challenged. We'll come, we'll come to the behaviors in a second. Can yeah. I, now just to, you know, we make it very clear to our midwives to say at any point during that pregnancy, if you find you're pregnant, you know, stop drinking, the impact of stopping drinking can it have an impact you you explain the different periods and the processes in the development of the central nervous system now if they stop drinking at that point in time can it have a a beneficial effect on the latter stages of development yeah the, the thing that we always say is the sooner you stop the better the chances of long term better outcomes are yeah. you know, if you if you have damaged something which is going to have significant downstream effects and you're vulnerable to that kind of a situation then it could go on to to do that but the majority of people who stop drinking will go on to have a relatively normal typical brain development because the rest of it will develop typically what you can't see so let me put it this way okay mm. i'm going to use hard data because it's easy to do that the alzbach database which which Cheryl Maguire did in 2019 paper, yep. um, demonstrated that 70 odd percent of women had drunk during pregnancy. That was taken in the 90s, where the recommendation was you're allowed to drink one to two units. So it was not unusual for that. So about 70 percent of women drank. Even though that's been the highest prevalence of FASD and sort of problems identified at 17 percent, there's 50 percent of people who didn't have any identifiable problem but had exposure. And that's probably because when they identified the pregnancy, a lot of them will have cut down or reduced their drinking because people do. A majority of people do. And mm. so it just demonstrates that the sooner you stop, the more likely and the, the less. You, and if you don't drink throughout the rest of the pregnancy, the more likely you are going to have a positive outcome. But you can't guarantee it. Um, and that's a, that's a situation. For example, if you stop drinking early on, then the other parts of the, pref the the second and third trimester stuff doesn't get affected in the same way. You're going to have a better outcome where, where compared to if you'd continue to drink throughout. Yeah. Um, the challenge that you've got, though, is what you don't know is if you've affected the potential of what that child's going to be compared to the, if there was no exposure at all. All you're saying is they haven't been affected enough to warrant being significantly disabled or having a real challenge so therefore you can't identify it from the normal variants that we have in society yeah no that's that clears up that one <laughs> very well thank you um now you were also an integral part in the um 
understanding of the comorbidities, the 428 comorbidities. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a bit of a deep dive into the comorbidities or the reasons behind those comorbidities as well? And a bit of an explanation. So, so that paper came about sort of um, 2011. Um, and we were in Vancouver. Lana Popova, who's the primary author, was doing this piece of work and she wanted some advice on the clinical aspect. I remember sitting there with a, um, what was it? It was a banana slice for a banana bread slice from Starbucks um, and chatting to her in the lobby of sort of the, 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 the Marriott as it was then where the conference was talking about what we were going to do. Yeah. Um, that's how these things come about. Um, and, and it's me who suggested we should go for the Lancet because, you know, at the time we weren't sure where to put it and we were quite pleased that it got in there. Um, the problem with all of that and the, the one line that I, what I really emphasize we need to put in was it, that it was by that there, there is an association with all these 428. You can't call them to be causal at that point in time. What we know is that, that when you drink alcohol, and I've already kind of mentioned it in an earlier answer is that there are epigenetic changes that can happen. It switches genes on and off. Mm. Not every child who is exposed to alcohol is going to have 428 comorbidities. That's a fact. You know, quite a lot of them will have three, four, five to eight, ten, you know, but none of them are going to have 428. And it's to do with the fact that every genome between two parents are going to be different and that will introduce vulnerabilities. And the way that the genome works is about 2% of it codes for protein, 98% of those tell those proteins where to go, what to be and how to turn themselves on and off. And there's things called promoter regions and regression regions, which turn stop, start kind of things. And they kind of are your instruction manual to tell where you're going to put your building blocks. And what the epigenome does is it's it's modified by opening and closing bits and alcohol can change that. And so what you have is if you have a vulnerability in that genome, by adding epigenetic markers, you are switching things on and off, which leads to this huge range of potential outcomes. Um, now, most of them are physical health, not all of them. Um, there's a lot of neurological stuff in there as well. But what you can find is that that leads to um, situations that can be addressed and dealt with. And when people say everybody with FASD is going to have these, it's not. There is there are certain things that are common, and that's more to do with the sledgehammer type thing that I talked about before, where you know that there's a vulnerability and there's going to be things like that. So you see things like cardiac cushion deficits in terms of the heart. You see things like the central nervous system because there's specific areas but a lot of the ones is that indirect impact. Mm. Uh, and so when we asked our first question, that also answers the comorbidity question yeah. um, because it affects both aspects and the mechanisms of action is pretty much those two things. And it can frequently cause a, an issue with regards to misdiagnosis because we need to see FASD as the primary diagnosis and all these other conditions that can be comorbidities that sit alongside it how does that work do you is that so, how you see it yes and no i see it fasd is the cause of damage to brain and body that is a syndrome that has led to this thing happening um the other things are outcomes of that damage okay um and so if you have prematurity uh, that's the main cause and the earlier the more premature you are the more likely you are to have issues um that is therefore the cause of damage to brain and body, whether alcohol is in the system or not. If you have a genetic syndrome, say Down syndrome, Fragile X, Nunu's, whatever, that is the thing that is known to be causing the change in the genetic structures, which leads to those genes being quoted or, or, or being read wrong, which leads to these outcomes. Here, prenatal alcohol and FASD is the etiological condition the thing that is causing damage to brain and body, which then leads to this whole range of other things. And so if you understand cause and outcome, this is the cause. Things like autism, ADHD, all the physical stuff you talked about are the outcomes. And so, so you have to look at it in a linear kind of relationship. And it's not about one taking precedence over another. It is yeah. about the relationship between all of these things and understanding what they are. And that's and what it should be. And as a result of that, it, you have to take a holistic approach, yeah. the care plan, 
and the management plan that supports those individuals throughout their life. Because again, different causes of damage to brain and body will differ in what the outcomes look like. Okay. And so if you take, say, five different genetic syndromes and add FASD next to it, they'll all have similarities because there's only a finite number of pathways in the, in the body and the brain. You know, and if you damage those pathways, you're going to get something. But all five of them or all six of them will have subtle differences as well. So some of them won't have any lateral preservation like you do with FASD. So the skills that you see won't be there, but some of the deficits will overlap. You know, and that's that's been demonstrated regularly where we do comparisons where very mm. rarely in in pediatrics, neurodevelopmental psychiatry, do we look for causes? Very rarely. You know, increasingly I think we should, because it really starts to tell us about the influence about what the positives are as well as what the deficits are and you have to manage both you build on positives you i know you're going to come to behavior in a second but you build on positives and you scaffold the deficits but unless you know both you're not going to work on that and if you don't know which parts of the brain are most likely to be vulnerable within different syndromes you don't know what the wider expectations are and what the phenotype the type of outcome that you're going to see is likely to be with each of these conditions and so it's really important to think about it in terms of cause an outcome and then if you have different causes what are the different types of outcomes that are seen absolutely so if we move on to the behavioral and social issues that uh fasd can can demonstrate we're looking at behaviors and i know when we were doing a presentation recently and we had Maggie May, and she really wanted to talk about the eight executive functions, working memory, impulse control, organization, flexible thinking, planning and prioritizing, emotional control, task initiation and self-monitoring. Because for her, being able to address those and identify those was her way of being able to explain to people that know nothing about FASD and even which is most of us actually um, to be able to understand her behaviors. Can you tell us a little bit about those eight executive functions? I know um, it's okay. a big question. I was, I was going to say, um, I'm glad you didn't ask me to list them because I wasn't going to be able to. Um, <laughs> um, uh, executive function is basically your prefrontal cortex is your higher functioning area okay what we know is as that front like i said it's again one of the previous questions frontal lobe blunting you get that problem in terms of that connectivity between the frontal lobes the different limbic system the hippocampus all those kind of areas which we know are affected by prenatal alcohol it's the central structures and so what you have is and, and you also get areas of strength so it doesn't look like it's there and so superficially you'll have skills and you'll have abilities, and then you'll have weaknesses. Executive function is, is what we talk about, those things that you describe, those areas of working memory. Working memory is not just executive function. There's other areas that are involved in that. Initiation is another thing which is common in terms of planning, organization. They're all the kind of things that are, are higher skills that come from this frontal lobe. And, and if you have damage to that, you're going to be challenged in those areas, and it's just a fundamental part of it. Now, it's not as simple as that. It never is, is it? Um, because let's take a simple task such as doing, and we do, we, we one of the tests that we do is called number letter sequencing. It's 1A, 2B, 3C, and you have to do those things. You copy it on a sheet to do it, and people go wrong because what you're doing there to get to, it doesn't sound complex, but it is, because what you're doing there is actually you're sequencing, you're switching, you are doing, um, tasks with planning, working memory, motor skills, at least five areas of cognitive function to do something as simple as going 1A, 2B, 3C. Okay. Nobody breaks it down like that. But if you've described those eight areas, that's five of them just there. Yeah. You see what I mean? And if there's deficits in all of them, what you can do is you can sequence or you can switch, but you can't do when you have to add them together. And it's the higher level stuff. Um, and what you start to get into is that is also affected by emotion. That is also affected by um, arousal and stress. And you have this thing called hot executive function, cold executive functioning. I don't know if you're going to come on to that later. But what that means is 
in a situation where you are calm and your emotional dysregulation is there, then you can maximize your abilities. So you may be able to do some of this. When you're having to add in emotional dysregulation on top of that, these five things become too much because you could probably do two of them with emotional dysregulation, but not all five. And that's where sort of where people appear to function in some situations, but not others. Um, and, you know, it's a complex interplay between the brain. The brain is not just one area. It is about different bits of the brain interfacing and integrating to be able to function and work out what's going on. So another example for you, I like giving this, um, um, is at the moment, uh, hopefully you're doing this, is that you're looking at the screen, you can see me, you can see Andrew and the picture, a second picture of Andrew, which is quite freaky that there's two Andrews, um, um, that, that you've got, um, and that what you're doing, is you're taking those pictures through your eyes, okay, that will cross over the brain in your optic chiasma, so it goes to the other side, so what goes on this side switches over to, to, to the other side, vice versa. That then spreads out to the occipital lobes, which is actually preserved in terms of some of, in terms of the alcohol side of it, and that deals with images. Then parietal lobe, if I was doing a presentation and you're looking at the things behind you, deals with the kind of the structures and the sort of those kind of art, the 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 pictorial bits and the language centers on the left are dealing with the other parts, and you're having to connect it all together and process it in a rapid manner, which is why. You know, if anybody is on here who's got FASD, they're probably not keeping up with me because I'm talking really quickly in complex terminology. Um, and this is not how I would talk to people with FASD because you would slow down. You would give people time to process. You would give them simpler language, potentially, if that's what they need. And you'd make adjustments for them to allow them to let that to process to get better. You would put them in a situation where, where the emotional arousal was lower so you can function better and you would start to think how you manage it knowing their brains function in a different way it's not that they can't do things but they have to do things to the maximum of their ability without external factors making it worse and even then they may struggle mm. but there's even then a wide variability within it so what maggie's talking about and i've seen maggie's on the call it's lovely to see you, by the way um but um but it's one of those that um it's very much that that is the kind of area that day to day is what society expects us to do. And it's the areas that are damaged. It's the expectation that as an adult, you can monitor yourself. That's the self-monitoring bit you talk about, that you can keep an eye of, this is me in my world. This is me in functioning. Mm -hmm. And so therefore I can see that I should not do this thing because I would be a bad or I can think about the consequences can weigh them up but let's break that down again one I'm looking after what I'm doing two I'm having to hold in my thoughts what is right and wrong who owns what and have the inhibitory control we've already said these are deficits and we've always said that the more layers you add on the harder it gets and life requires you to have multiple processing and multiple bits all the time and that's where it gets hard. And that's what people don't see. Because when it's doing one thing at a time, sequential processing, not parallel processing, they're far more capable. And when we test people, you test people on sequential processing first, tick, they can do it. Then you do parallel processing. No, they can't do it. But you've already scored highly by being able to do the sequential tasks. And so when you're assessing people, they score better than they should compared to how they do in the real world because the real world requires much more parallel processing than it does sequential processing does that make sense it does um, it, but it, and, and it's, it's part of the it's it, that's the complexity of how the brain works and how society requires us to function because it ain't about you or the people living in isolation from society yes and it also explains or this is where I want to come on to fluctuating capacity, because as you said, in a stressful situation, an individual with FASD will have this fight or flight mode. Uh, I would, you know, can you explain that in, in the way that you've just explained it in sort of um, technical terminology, how fluctuating capacity is evidenced? 
and how it um, would... so it's, it's again fluctuating this is a difficult one because again, again they're all difficult ones really there's nothing straightforward fasd i think if you understand fasd everything else is easy um <laughs> I'm serious about that. It's yeah, I, I believe that. I because, absolutely believe because, that. Because most other things are, are one thing or another. This is multiple things together. And mm. that's a challenge. So how does that work in terms of fluctuating capacity? The capacity and decision making requires you and is not a single thing because it depends on it's a situational dependent thing. And the requirements for decision making around capacity will vary from situation to situation. So financial matters, for example, is a really high bar in terms of the requirement for capacity, whereas to have a, a relationship, especially a sexual relationship, is really low bar, you know? And so it's really variable as to what level of understanding you have to have and what decision-making ability you have to have for all of these things. Now, remember what you said before in the previous question about self-monitoring and about multiple processing capacity, just a simple example, requires you to be able to understand what the issue is be able to hold it in your memory, weigh up the different factors that are going on to then communicate your decision based upon your weighing up of the different things which you're holding in your working memory. You've already said oh, half of these things are difficult. And so it's going to be a challenge at the best of times. We've also said you've got a situation where arousal shuts your brain off. The chemicals, mm -hmm. it's like a switch and you can see it. And people who've got dissociative disorders it's exactly what's going on is hyper arousal states and the chemicals that are produced when you're hyper aroused stop your frontal lobes from functioning properly right. and so what you end up with is a situation where in a calm collected situation where somebody's supporting you asking you the questions you can give them all the right answers real world lots going on everything's buzzing you know you've got the sensory overload that's going on your emotions are up here you can't, you're not seeing the context of it. You just want to get on and get out of the situation. You're not thinking straight. Do you have capacity in that situation? Uh, now, fluctuating capacity was originally conceived for dementias where you had a period of, of capacity. It would go away for a bit and it would come back. Yeah. It doesn't work properly for people where this is so permanent. The Code of Protection has kind of gone through and there's elements of case law and the Code of Practice is basically saying if you keep doing the same thing, then it is likely to be deemed that you lack capacity to make those decisions if you constantly make those kind of decisions. Right. The case law is still being worked through. Uh, and I'm not a lawyer and I don't pretend to be. I avoid the courts like the plague. I hate going to court sort of thing. I have to sometimes because of reports we do, they want to know about it. And it's like everything, you know, it's new to them as well. However, I avoid it. Um, and I think that's the, the situation where the courts have to tell us where the threshold is because this is as much a legal consideration as much as a biological one i can tell you what's going on in somebody's brain easily not a problem at all but where you define the line as to what is deemed legally capacitous and what isn't is a judgment made by a court not by a doctor and i think that's the bit that we still haven't got full clarity on has this been an area in Canada, Canada? Because I know with the they're more advanced with their legal system in working with FASD courts, and is that something that they've so, looked into? So they might have done. I'm not 100 percent sure. The problem is that that it has to be the UK legal system for it to work in this country. Sure. Uh, and there's that, so you can take lessons from other areas, but mm -hmm. there has to be case law in the UK defined on that. So the capacity. So the the the. The legislation around capacity, the Capacity Act, it defines what that should be. It defines what the different factors are, but it doesn't really help in a situation until the UK case law has defined where those thresholds are. And until cases go through the Court of Protection where that's defined, in the UK legislation, we need we, we struggle a little bit. Right. Can I move on to another favourite conversation, which it, this leads into nicely, I think, is confabulation. Mm -hmm. And understanding confabulation and how the brain pr processes work with that, because I think for any neurotypical individual to understand confabulation is a real stretch, because I know when you hear somebody with FASD explain that they the information that they are saying at the time is genuinely what they believe happened. 
in their mind. They can genuinely feel and believe that that was the truth. And it might have been snippets of information that was brought to them. But at the moment that they're asked that question, they genuinely believe in their heart of hearts that that is the truth. And yet it is a version of a truth. Can you explain how confabulation works? Yeah. Have you had Gilbert on here? Just kind of just check. Um, I have had Gilbert on, yes. Uh, so he will have talked about it because his that's right. Because he because he, Gilbert's research was on uh, suggestibility and confabulation, and so yeah. and again, being his PhD supervisor, it was our guidance that took him took him down that path to study. Now he's taken yeah. like all good PhD students to now doctorates. Now that's becoming his area of expertise, and he's running with it, which is great. And we've got a meeting with him tomorrow, so he, okay. it's great. Yeah. Looking forward. He, to he, yeah, and so Gilbert's great, and so um and and and. He, He's he's the he's the man on this now. What happens? Okay, right. So confabulation is where you truly believe what you're saying, but there's a lot of issues going there. Again, it's about that frontal lobe stuff comes back into it. There's a thing called source monitoring, where you're where to do any kind of memory and recall. Again, you have to recall memory into your working memory. You have to be able to hold it there. You have to be able to manipulate it and understand. And when we have episodic pieces of memory, they timestamp events with a timestamp. OK, um, and when you recall it, you kind of know when I was five years old, this thing happened compared to when I was 15 years old, this other thing happened. You know, now somebody who's got a source monitoring issue is those timestamps get mixed up sometimes or what you've experienced in a different situation gets mixed up and your recall of events is because your filing system's mixed up. It's like, let's take a filing system. I've, I'm, I'm slightly obsessive and I've got different drop folders for everything in my filing cabinets, which are over here, which I'm pointing at. You can't see them, but they're over there. Um, and there's different drop folders. Now let's imagine I suddenly take all the drop folders and shove them all into the, the thing and there's no drop folders, but all the paperwork's just there. It's a mess. What you've got is I'm going to pit out two random bits of information and, and I'm going to say, oh, this is the information, but they could not be, they couldn't be correlated. And so you basically are mixing up what you have learned or you have experienced because, and they believe those two things to be true because the timestamps are wrong, but the memory would exist. Now, there's also a second factor here is sometimes the social context of that. And we see this quite a lot, actually, is that because there is a social understanding that I want to be part of a situation or I understand that I need to say something that actually they say what they think is right without understanding the social context of other people can see that it's not quite correct. And so that social understanding part also means they're not reading the situation. And so they're telling stories which they, they don't disbelieve, but they're not seeing that other people can see that they're not correct. Um, and there's and, the heightened, the heightened anxiety as well. So not always, not always. Sometimes it is, sometimes it is. And so I've heard stories of people where confabulation is basically about fitting in. It's like, I'll give you an example is that somebody was telling narrative about um, having some sort of um, negative impact that happened to, I'm not going to go into detail, something bad happened to them. Something bad had happened to the girl with FASD when she was much younger, but was telling the same story to try and fit into the group of ki girls in the camp telling the stories about that. But he was telling the stories as she's experienced it, but mixing up who did what, when and how. Now, there was something about she wanted to fit in, hence telling the story, because most people don't just go and tell your negative stories. But she was doing that. She wanted to feel fitting in. But then what happened with the time stamping is mixed up. Now, that's just one way that it can happen. The nature of the detail of how confabulation works, that's the kind of stuff we want Gilbert to try and pull apart. Right. Because to do that is that you really need to look at the function of somebody's brain, what they're doing at the time, what's happening where, and how these things correlate together. Um, and what he's demonstrated and the numbers he had for, so anybody who's watching this, you know, he, he'll need more people for the next part of his research. Um, but what he demonstrated is that a small proportion of people, not everybody, and that's really important, not everybody confabulates with FASD, a certain proportion do. When they said what they said, they record bits of the story a week later where they've got a memory. So there's that timestamp bit because at the, they didn't make the mistake within an hour. They made the mistake a week later. Um, and they came up with bits where they filled in gaps of other parts of the memory, where the memory had faded, the timestamp had faded, um, and then mix things up 
and they brought in things which were not in the story at all, mm. perfectly reasonable for a story, but were not true at all for what the narrative they've been told the week before. And so people then look like they're saying stuff, but they say in such a believable, realistic way, if you mm. didn't know this was a situation, you would basically go along with it. And so it is something that is seen in a proportion of people with FASD, not everybody with FASD. And that's important. Not everybody with FASD can fabulate, some do. Um, and where they do, it is extremely believable. And it's something again to do with the time stamping memory and recall phase and the social context that fits together. And it's again, nothing with FASD is simple, but it's nothing that interaction between that, that side of it. I'm going to ask for another one that I'm sure is not simple. And it's one that came from um, a young man with FASD. And he said, how come I am able to advise somebody else on something I see it very clearly in them and I can advise them and I give them great suggestions and they take that my advice and they run with it, but I cannot act upon that myself in my own life. Okay. Uh, go back to the, to the self, the executive function eight domains. One of them was self-monitoring. All right. The problem is, you know what you're meant to do, you know what you do, but self-monitoring yourself in that situation means that you're splitting your sort of focus you can let's say you can do three things all right you can advise people you can sit plan or you can sequence all right or you could do one of these things you enter in self-monitoring is one of those three three things you can't do four okay and so it's broken down and it's about capacity of your brain's ability to manage certain situations and self-monitoring is doing so many other things in that context means that actually in a rational cold situation where you're having giving people advice you know this is why if i ask somebody with fasd direct questions they'll often give decent answers it's yeah. not that they don't know it but living it working it and monitoring and having that oversight is more complex and what we're asking is that one step more than their brainers are able to manage in terms of that and there's a variability within this in this in um the population not everybody can do it whether they've got fasd or not some people can let's say some people can manage 10 things and so more than the eight uh, if you see what i mean yeah. other people can only manage two and that's the variability that you see and FASD depends on where you are within that spectrum as to what you can do and what you can't do. And if you're if you can only manage three of those executive function things at any one time, if you introduce a fourth, it falls down. Yeah. Uh, that that's that's really good explanation. Thank you, of course. Um talking about organization and planning and prioritizing, you mentioned your file structures and explaining that when we get specifics about um, somebody who says that, you know, they have to write lists, they write lists to be able to help them. I have to write lists to stay organized, spinning all the plates that I spin. And yet somebody with FASD trying to organize something becomes a can of worms. Can you explain a little bit more about that so that they, in, in a way that, Individuals with FASD will understand it, how the brain is working at that time in a simple layman's term. <laughs> okay, so go back to the number of things that they can manage. All yeah. right. So if let's say you can manage two things or three things, if you can do those three things in a calm situation, that's great. But when you're planning and like you say, how many plates do you want to spin? Um, an organization and planning requires often multiple spinning plates and that's where it becomes too much and what happens then is anxiety kicks in and knocks down one of your three to two so it gets worse and then your anxiety goes up and your two goes down to one um, and that's what's happening is that if you could manage that anxiety you maximize your ability to function to the level of what you can do if you if you have anxiety on top of that then your ability levels are going to go down 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 so let's say it's you now andrew okay um you can manage six things but it's a really pressured thing and you're going to get really stressed about it you may find you can only manage five you know it's the same for all of us is the more stress and the more pressure you have the less your ability to function and there is a j-shaped curve of anxiety stress and function so a little bit of stress is good but the higher level it is, the more you get anxious, the less you function. 
And that's well documented in psychological principles uh, in terms of that. A little bit is positive, a lot isn't. Um, and it's the same across the board. And that's what's happening is that you're getting their J-shaped curve is quite shallow in terms of the little J bit and they get into the high bits very quickly. And so it's a combination of anxiety and capacity, really. I think it's probably the easiest way of deciding it. That's excellent. Thank you for that. I, I want to get on to assessments um, mm -hmm. now because many of our families that might not have a diagnosis of FASD and they're looking for assessments or later on as they're transitioning into adulthoods, they need to be reassessed at a later stage. You explained the process that you use in assessing, one of your processes that you're using in assessing. Can you tell us where we can find some of the best access the best assessments for our families, for our individuals, um, to be able to give them greater support if they can't get that, if they're on that long waiting list and you so, need to get them. All right, so in Kent, it's slightly different to other parts of the, the country because Kent has, well, it did have, and it hopefully should, still does have a um, hub and spoke commission service. So you can get access to a pediatrician who can do local assessments. And if they need to see more complex, they can come to us. That's an agreed a process. That's hub and spoke. You want people to be seen locally and to get an assessment as easily as possible without extra resource or extra need. The more complex you make it, the less likely you are to get it. The more money it's going to cost you, the less likely you are to get it, especially in the current situation. So you are part of the group that helped develop Time Is Now. That is where I would start. It is a good practice document which talks about um, how to interpret and deliver different situations, different scenarios, the hub and smoke model. So the NHS England document described it. Time Is Now talks about how to deliver it. Um, as you, you may know, as we were talking about before we started this recording, is that I've just submitted the Royal, a document to the Royal College, which will go through its processes and hopefully be accepted of psychiatrists. And that talks about how to implement those kind of situations so that people in a local setting will identify in the people who are, are being referred FASD. If you can start there, you will suddenly find you've got loads of it and that you can develop specific pathways. What won't happen is it won't change overnight from having nothing to everything. And so you have to do this in a stepwise fashion to allow services to develop and to change and to progress towards that scenario. And documents like the time is now is what I would direct people towards as a good practice document to say that this is how you could do it. And that's, I mean, I totally agree. I think it's an excellent document. But if there's in schools, is there any quick access assessment tool for a school that they can start Schools should be making with? diagnosis. Schools. schools we're not looking at a diagnosis. We're looking at. <coughs> Needs-based uh, assessment. Uh, yeah. So, so, so a lot of schools are starting to do needs-based assessment, but that's not about diagnosis and other stuff. And it's about what tools they have and what resources they have. What we always say is start with what you've got. Don't start and try and add in extra things unless you, you know, which is going to cost you until you really have to. Uh, and when you do keep it simple and cheap, because you're going to get away with simple and cheap because the NHS hasn't got loads of money. And only when it's really complicated, go for complicated and expensive. We're complicated and expensive, my team. OK. Yep. Um, and so but there's few of us and we only see tip of the iceberg. What you want is a majority of people to be seen locally with with good enough to get your diagnosis and management plan and have a full understanding of the profile on the most obvious cases, because the most obvious cases are going to sort of scream out at you on all the tools that you can get locally. And it's only the gray cases in the middle, is it or isn't it, or where there's lots of other things going on that really need complex assessments. Um, not everybody needs a team like ours. It really doesn't. And what you want to do is to get to see a local pediatrician, get an effective assessment quickly and, and or psychiatrist and move on. St schools will look at needs and they'll look at what is the profiling. And my big problem with some of the needs-based assessment approaches that are happening across countries is they don't assess everything. You know, they assess bits of the jigsaw, so, but often not the most important bits of the jigsaw. And if you've got 10 pieces missing, you're going to miss things. And so that's one of the fundamentals issues that I've got with how needs-based assessment work. I'm not anti it. I think there's things, but then you should assess a broader range of needs, not just one or two. Um, are there any the out challenge. there that are there any out there that 
somebody could access that you what would you recommend um, and need. So I'm not. So that I don't work with schools is the problem. So I'm not. I can't advise what they wouldn't do. I can tell you what, what I'd advise to a pediatric clinic and what I'd advise to a psychiatric clinic in terms of the minimum type of things they should do. They should look at exactly functions. So things like the brief they should look at language should look at adaptive functioning look at sensory you know these are all tools that you can do fairly easily with informant and, and in self-report questionnaires which doesn't read direct testing if they look at asd and adhd you've got six domains out of the nine immediately then if you look at their education which is always reported you've got seven domains immediately and they're the core ones that you need to understand how to manage one. If you look at the brief, all those domains that you talked about are assessed under there. So you can tell, and I can tell, if you give me a brief, I'll tell you what the profile of that person is. I really will, mm -hmm. because, it, because I know how to interpret it, because I've been trained how to do it, and I know what I'm looking for. That's what you do. And on the most obvious cases, that's how you work it. And that's where you need supervision from teams like ours whilst they're developing. And that's where you need a hub in terms of a consultative model and that's where Hub and Spoke works. And that's what I've been going on about for years. You know, I've some people on here I've seen, I know Marie Catrick, I saw her name on there. Mm -hmm. She knows full well, and other people who I've known for multiple years, I think I've known Marie for nearly 20 years now. Mm -hmm. um, they've heard me talk about this for, for over a decade. Um, and that is why, because what you need to have is people seen close to home, but being able to consult and support by people who can help them interpret it until they're ready to do it on their own. And that's the way that it has to work um, because we want people to be sitting quickly, close to where they live, not having to traipse down to Surrey because Surrey should be for Kent, Surrey and Sussex cases really, or for the ones who are the most complex that nobody else can do. And that's what we want. But, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Um, no, it, it, it partly does. I mean, until that time, until we have hubs around the country or uh, something else, there's, we're looking for something that families can latch on to, to be able to, to give them hope. That's the, 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 and I think that's the challenge is this. <laughs> I'd love to say this is what you do, but I don't think I've got the solution mm. um, because uh, what's needed is money. Yeah, what's needed is support and resources, and I'm not. I'm. I'm not the chancellor. I told it to Jeremy Hunt, unfortunately, because he's the one who sets our budget. They haven't agreed the budget yet, um, and that's. And we've got two weeks before the before the next financial year starts, um, and there is a real challenge going on here, to between resource and ability to do this, which is why I'm saying, if you can get things done cheaply, you're much more likely to get it through than if you try and argue that you have to have a specialist team everywhere to start with. You know, you need specialist teams. Don't get me wrong. I'm a specialist team. But you start with getting it right for everybody with support and consultation of those experts whilst you develop. And then those local teams where they've identified it more will suddenly become the hub and you'll invest in them to do it further. It will take time. But what you keep doing and families need to do is bang on at their local resources, the local commissioners, because that will do it. And that was what you could do. Let's look at how you got the Kent service going. You and Tracy and the FSD awareness group there, you know, you banged on at the commissioners there uh, and you didn't let it go. That's how you got a service. I didn't do it. You did it. Sure. You know, and, that's, and this and is, that's, and this is something that we, you know, we do in every single webinar we present. It's about, actually talk to your MPs, talk to your commissioners. Let's exactly get the word out there, educate. That's exactly what you do. I'm going to move on. Um, you'll be relieved to hear. Um, I would like to, I, we get asked frequently about the best forms of therapy that are recommended for individuals with FASD. Now, I'm going to t come back to what you've been saying and sort of bringing up all night. And that is, it's never an easy answer. Every individual is individual. Um, so can you give us some of the therapies that are recommended for certain individuals and why certain individuals are not others? CBT, for example. All right. So so you answered it partly. There is no one therapy <laughs> that's been identified for people with FASD. There are specific types of intervention, for example, alert is about sensory modulation and decreasing arousal you've got mile and other things which are for about educating maths and other stuff there's specific interventions for different facets of fasd nobody's really looked at something as big as does cbt work because actually 
It will for some, it won't for others. We advocate a behavioral approach in terms of PBS model because it has evidence base in learning ability and autism and actually for some of the neurodevelopmental issues and understanding it from that brain related stuff, it's likely to have a beneficial effect. Um, but that's again for the people who've got more severe levels of presentation and function. People who are milder, who've got trauma, may well need to have a more psychodynamic approach. But it depends on their individual ability to engage and, and to look at their emotional recognition and to function. And so, again, it will vary between person to person. And the thing that you have to bear in mind is FASD is a broad spectrum of presentation. And so you have to understand what is going to do. Let me talk you back to CBT. CBT requires you to self-monitor and to recognize in yourself what you're doing and knowing how to intervene. Um, and what did we just say in many of the uh, previous questions? You can't self-monitor very easily at times, especially at times when you're heightened arousal. And what we try to do, we try to manage your arousal by self-monitoring. Uh, not going to work. And so, and so, do you see what I mean? Is yeah, There isn't the evidence base around this kind of stuff, which is why a PBS model, which is about external people and internal people working together and deciding who intervenes at what stage and how that functions is probably a better kind of approach to it. But again, We've tried to talk about evidence-based interventions for a long time. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. So psychoeducation, our specific course, which we've developed for parenting, is a psychoeducation course for families that changes people's families' expectations and behavior. We've now fully recruited to the feasibility study. That will then change in, hopefully, if we were going to apply for funding in later this year for the full trial, and hopefully next year we'll go to full trial, where we'd need several hundred people to be part of it. Um, and so if that's evidence-based, what will happen is that is the therapeutic intervention aimed at parents rather than individuals, because by changing parents' behavior and teaching them how to manage better, you end up with better functioning children. That's the plan, so that's the type of therapy. Um, and what you will have is that will then, if we can prove the evidence and it works, then NICE will recommend it, then everybody will get it. You know, the myfasd.me website you know it's a psychoeducation approach for individuals the the misfits game and sort of those kind of things they're all psychoeducational interventional therapeutic whether you realize it is or isn't it is a psychoeducational tool you are teaching and training people about themselves you're getting self-recognition through that and there is a therapeutic part to that approach whether people realize that's what they're doing or not therapy isn't sitting down on a couch and talking about your uh, innermost thoughts and feelings and your sleep and your dreams and stuff that's psychodynamic psychotherapy which is rarely beneficial in this group it can be in the right people so um you know i don't know if that answers your question again but it's 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 as you said it ain't simple yeah um let's move on um, i'd like to talk a little bit about um vulnerability mm -hmm. in FASD individuals in choice making. You know, we've we've covered this, I know, in your explanation earlier, but I just want to be able to look because we have a we spoke to Gilbert, as you said, about confabulation and particularly the impact of that with in the judicial system. And uh when we're looking at transitioning from um childhood into adulthood and this huge risk as services drop away mm -hmm. frequently and we're looking at the management plan and talking about how the ideal would be to have that management plan wrap around service support this individual throughout their lifetime can you explain what happens as the brain is developing through into adulthood what do we see in an adult with fasd because obviously there's age um, disparity involved as well, isn't there? Yeah. So I think this is what my first my question to you was going to be: what, where, where do you define adulthood? You know, is that expectations? And if you have it, do you define it on chronological age or do you develop on developmental age? Um, because we define it by chronological age in the UK and in around the world. Um, and adulthood starts when you turn 18. Now, what's the difference between 17 years and, and 11 months compared to 18 years and one month, except the law says you're an adult. One month you can't drink, the day after you can. 
you know, yeah. what's the difference? Um, and, and how does that differ, therefore, in terms of your biological maturity of your brain? It doesn't, because it's a legal definition. We said before, law defines that by a certain proportion, you should be able to do X, Y, and Z. That's legal definition, which has been started by Parliament and the court and the statute, which is interpreted by the courts. And that's how it works. Um, you know, there is talk about reducing some of the, some of that to 16, to some of the some of the definitions of it and so but for somebody where the developmental trajectory is shallower and the most of the gap getting bigger then it doesn't mean that people won't catch up in some ways or they won't develop it but they're getting there at a slower rate and so the expectations will vary and you will have different issues at different stages um, and so it comes back to that fundamental question of how do we define this and why are we setting people sometimes up to fail and and the expectations and we mentioned this before of society compared to what people can function and do because their brains work in a different way is the balance and the challenge that people have and that doesn't mean that they shouldn't have the rights and the expectations of an adult in terms of what they can and can't do but you know there's that classic diagram of somebody who's 20 with different size mm. people and stuff yeah. you know I mean, i've never been the biggest fan of that because it's taken from a vineland um kind of stuff and it's done in that diagrammatic way but what it's trying to show is that there is a variability in the individual's level of ability to function because of they've got la preservation of some areas which work typically at an age appropriate level and others which are deficit and can't function as well and so, and that will vary from person to person. And that's the other thing that we must emphasize is no two people with FASD are the same. Mm. They're not. There's the similarities and overlaps, but there'll be differences as well. Um, and so we need to treat people as individuals. That's really important. Um, and we don't, and we generalize everybody with FASD has this, they don't. Um, they'll have certain similarities, but not necessarily everything being the same. Um, and then we need to say, well, what is your level of functioning? What is your presentation? How do we understand that in that context? Um, and this is where our understanding and sophistication around neurodivergence and how etiologies differ in terms of presentation still isn't there. And, and the law and society certainly isn't there. And I don't know how to really explain it more than that, really, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. and, and that does, of course, lead to great rate of vulnerability. For, oh, totally. For we don't, so, so look, we, so if you, I don't know how many people have seen my model of sort of my, my psychiatric onion model, which I talk about a lot. And we talk about complex trauma, really, where you have the brain at related aspects, at least them being vulnerable to environmental effects and then life happening, which impacts on them. But you have to look through the lens of the brain. What we don't do is look through the lens of the brain and blame everything on environmental cues. And that's not fair or correct either but they are extremely vulnerable to the world and experiencing different things because of expectations of society, the gap gets bigger. And the more they get to adulthood, the expectation is far greater than they can manage. The expectations on a three-year-old are not massive, so they function pretty well. The expectations on an eight-year-old are getting bigger, but they're still not that far apart. The expectations on an 18-year-old, I'm sorry, is, is more than many people can sometimes manage because they're just not ready to deal with everything that an adult is expected to deal with. You know, it's hard enough for, for a neurotypical 18 year old sometimes to mm -hmm. transition between the requirements of adulthood and childhood. Um, add in neurodevelopmental disorder on top of that, it becomes even more complex. And with all those executive functions that are yep. playing their game as well, it increases that, that level of uh, risk, if you like. But, as you said earlier, you have been working hard at developing this along with um, some of the team up at Salford, working on the training of um, families in retraining almost, isn't it? The parenting skills to understand better the strategies, understand the condition better. To that way, you're able to support them with that management plan and move forward. Because as we are always looking for at every single support group that we offer all our training we're looking for positive outcomes here and there it's not all doom and gloom there is a lot of positivity you highlighted some of the great skills and strengths and qualities in many of the individuals with FASD and with that right wraparound support and understanding they can lead to positive outcomes can't they 
So I've seen people with FASD give testimony in the House of Parliament, you know, in, in all party parliamentary groups. Mm. I think you've seen them do yep. that as well. Yep. We've seen them stand up in front of huge audiences and give lectures, but then melt down afterwards. Yes. You know, you, you need to understand what support they need, but also their, what their strengths are, because later on they'll find that, you know, it that there's a huge amount of skill and that that these the individuals have the, and a lot of positives and a lot of strengths. And if you look at the strength based approaches, what we want to shift the narrative to, and I say this all the time, we're trying to shift the narrative from a deficit based model, i.e., all the bad stuff, to a strength based model, i.e., all the good stuff. And yeah. what you do to that is you scaffold the deficits, i.e., you put in place things that help them. And so, for example, if they can't self monitor, they don't expect them to simple as that mm. help them with it you do some of the self-monitoring and point out to them before they get too stressed you know jimmy what what do we say about that and and before they get to the point where they're stressed and can't see it themselves they need to accept that help mm. and so there's something about the how you get to that point and that's the parenting course that's the skills of actually doing it in a way that actually people can start to embed but you need to shift the narrative because we need it to be about the positives we need to build on the strengths, but not forget that if we don't scaffold the deficits, then all the negatives will come out. And we do with our training presentations, we have Maggie May involved. And one of the points that I like to stress, because she appears and comes across very eloquent, very um, highly intelligent and very knowledgeable in her field, which she is. But in order to go through that, she might have had 48 hours of lack of sleep in anxiety in preparation for that. Mm. The thinking and the planning to be able yeah. to be at that meeting, at that training seminar at that time has been a huge complex. And we scaffold her in order yeah. to support her. To Let me be ask you a question. I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. Please do. How, how tired will you feel after having prepared for all of this? Well, talking to you, you always exhaust me anyhow. <laughs> well, there you go. You see? There you go. But that's the point. Um, and exhaust, if you have a brain that is that can function and that can compensate but has to work twice as hard as a typical brain to do the same thing, you're going to get tired. You know, my wife calls me a grumpy bugger, so you told me not to swear, but that's not really swearing, um, mm -hmm. if I'm tired, all right? Um, and just imagine getting tired for doing simple things and that level of tiredness leads to anxiety which leads to meltdown which leads to your brain not functioning it is that vicious cycle you have to recognize it within people and give people breaks give people sort of ways of functioning but still scaffold them for doing it and actually recognize and reward them for what skills that they do have and actually encourage them because it should be good to encourage people to actually do things because actually long term people will feel great that they've achieved it. Absolutely. Um, um, but the flip side of it is you have to recognize that when you're finished, you are going to crash. So fine, have a crash. What's wrong with that? You know, you know, if you've, if you've, you know, go relax, go do whatever you do to chill out after you've had a big, big thing, but you give yourself a pat on the back and reward yourself, but expect to crash. Because yeah. why is it not right to crash when you've done so much and put so much effort in? You know, if it's causing anxiety, the, the question that you have to ask with all of that, if, if it's too much, should you be doing it? Okay. However, you know, we all get a little bit anxious the first time we do things or we do situations. So if it outco the outcome is positive at the end of it and it's good to do and you get the support to do it, then it's about supporting them in the right way, recognizing it that. And that's about people like yourself, Andrew, and the people around Maggie there, mm -hmm. helping her to function so she can get through that two days of anxiety. And then she's allowed to crash and allowed to basically have that downtime built into the, the expectation of it as part of it because then that's the expectation that that's what, what, what what's going to happen and everybody knows it um but it doesn't stop you doing it because it's really valuable because we need to hear from people like her Absolutely. because because it's their voice that matters more than my voice and uh, well listen i'm going to let you crash now roger Thank you. so in addition to thanking roger once again for joining us tonight and taking your time to be able to educate us all to the complexities of FASD. As you said, it's never that easy to understand. It's so complex. But you've given us an insight tonight, and hopefully there'll be many professionals 
and families living with FASD on this call tonight that will go away with some a greater understanding of maybe how to manage those behaviours, how to understand why they exist and therefore give the space and the time to those individuals living with FASD and actually support them better in giving that scaffolding around those individuals to support them and lead to better outcomes. If that means that we have to change the way that we approach our parenting skills, our professional understanding, then so be it. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. If you want to find out more about FASD, then come to our um, YouTube channel uh, where we have two years worth of webinars and our educational videos on our Be Aware campaign. Or alternatively, what you can do is go to our website on www.fasdawareness.org.uk. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, good night. Thanks again, Roger. All the best. See you later.